from the age of about five, I had a real dislike for doctors. Because at the age of five, the doctors, they put me in a hospital and they stole my tonsils. And it was painful. Before we migrated from South Africa to Australia at the age of seven, they gave me a stamp injection. That's all I can, that's all I can describe it. It was an injection and, and it had five needles on it. And they would just go stamp. And I don't know what they gave me, but it was on my left shoulder. And those, those are from other countries. You might recognize that uh, little stamp because you might have one as well. And I didn't like that. It was painful. And so when we came to Australia, my local school had free dental checkups on the ground. And for all the students, uh, we were given, uh, we had to go to the dentist and have this, uh, this checkup. And so I discovered that the dentist doctor is not very friendly either because he has some tools which are a little bit painful. I was introduced to the dentist drill. You know the one that goes Ehh! and he, if he touches one of your nerves in your gums, you, start, you jump sky high. So at the age of 10 I was introduced to that. I was also introduced to the dentist electric toothbrush and the fact that you've got to open your mouth and keep it open as wide as you can while he does his work. But the scariest thing about the dentist, I have to say, at the age of 10, was the numbing needle. You know the, the horse needle that they have? And you watch it disappear into your gum and you think surely it's going to come out and it just keeps going and going and going. And so I did not like doctors very much growing up. My friends, as a child, I thought as a child, and I did not see my need for a physician. But the tonsils had to go. Healing could not take place until the tonsils left. Healing could not take place until those decayed teeth left. And my friends, I'd like to submit to you that in our lives, healing cannot take place unless something goes. Something's got to go. In our spiritual walk, something has got to go before healing can take place. For no man, the Bible says, can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. And I like what Joshua says. Choose you this day. Who will you serve? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And this morning, the Lord is calling us to wake up out of our slumber. Romans 13 verse 11. And do this, knowing the time. It is high time. Wake out of slumber for our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. In our lives, something has got to go for healing to take place. And Lord, it is my prayer that we humble ourselves, that we will choose life, that we will choose you. Come by here, my Lord, kumbaya, as we say in South Africa. There are people here, Lord, who need a prayer, who need a word of encouragement, who need hope. And Lord, come by here and bless us this morning. For Jesus' sake, amen. I was in my mid-twenties, and uh, some of you have heard the story before, part of it. And I used to love playing soccer. And unfortunately, this one particular day, we were playing a competition, a very serious competition. And my right leg was broken. 
it was snapped in half. The tibia and the fibula bones were snapped. And my friends, when that happened, I knew straight away. I was kicked and I knew straight away that they were broken. I was afraid because one moment as a young man, I was in control of my life and the next moment, I, I, was, it was, out of, I was out of control. My life was out of my hands. I was taken to the hospital and I had to trust the doctors by faith. And I thanked them by faith. Especially when they said to me, everything will be okay, young man. And my friends, it took a broken leg for me to realize that I needed someone else's help to mend the broken pieces which was left behind. I needed someone else to mend me, for I could do nothing. I could not do anything. Self, pride, and dignity was left at the hospital door. You know what I mean? When you go into hospital, you don't take any of those things with you. You got to get showered, you get showered. And so I came out of hospital a new creature, a new creation, a new man. If I wanted healing, I needed to listen to the doctors and the nurses' advice. Like Jacob, my friends, we need to, we need to wrestle with God and we need to see that it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance and healing, lest anyone should boast. We need to wrestle with God. And my friends, I would challenge you that it took a broken leg for me to surrender. And I would challenge you that for Jacob, it took a broken hip for him to be blessed by the Lord. For he wrestled with God all night. And God said to him, release me. And he said, I will not release you unless you bless me. And Jacob needed to be broken in order for the blessing to, to be bestowed. And my friends, we too need to leave something at God's door if we want healing from the broken pieces in our lives. We need to come to a place where self, pride and dignity is left at God's open door of love and that God's love and humility heal us. My friends, until we see our brokenness and let God has, have his way in us, we will never be healed and sin will keep robbing us of the joy and the peace that we find in Jesus Christ. Until we taste death, we shall never experience true life in Jesus Christ. Until we surrender self to the cross, we shall never be raised up anew. I like the text in Isaiah 14 and verse 31, one of my favorite texts. Great encouragement. For they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, for they shall rise up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not grow weary, they shall walk and not faint. My friends, this morning, I'd like to have a look at that text. For verse 1 says that they that wait upon the Lord, they that wait upon the Lord, serve the Lord. I like to look at that word, wait. Have you ever gone to a restaurant or a, or a hotel or somewhere, and the waiters come out, and they're waiting upon you? And I always thought, that waiting for the Lord, wait upon the Lord means to just sit by, say your prayers, wait upon the Lord, and wait for Him to answer. Ah, oh, but my friends, they that wait upon the Lord, they that, let me paraphrase, paraphrase, they that serve the Lord, they that serve the Lord shall renew their strength. My friends, Jesus came to save and to seek the lost. And I challenge you that we should seek to serve the lost through humility of heart and of Jesus. The Lord will give you courage and strength, for they shall run and not grow weary. 
For in the word of the Lord they find great joy, and it is not burden, burdensome nor tiresome, for it is in God's strength that they live and move and have their being. They shall walk and not faint. My friends, this morning, the battle, the battle that we face with self is ever and only won by lifting Jesus higher and joy is the victory. My friends, I'd like us to turn to Romans 8, verses 37 to 39. Romans 8, verses 37 to 39. Romans 38. Oh, sorry, Romans 8, verses 37 to 39. Romans 8. And Romans 8 talks about the love of God. How nothing can separate us. Starting at verse 37. It reads, Yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, or things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, that is such a beautiful text. And this morning, if you have come and you're feeling discouraged and burdensome, this text is for you. For we have soul-saving good news this morning. For nothing can separate us from the love of God this morning. God loves us with an everlasting love. Oh, but my friends, the question is, God loves us. But what separates us from loving Him? What separates us from loving Him? him my friends can i suggest to you that what separates us is self self separates us from god choosing to do my own will and not god's will choosing to live by my own rules my own standards and not by god's the greatest deception of self is that self wants to be independent Independent of God, we don't need God. We have Duracell batteries. We can live and move and have our being by ourselves. Self wants to be the greatest, like the Most High. And you cannot serve two masters. Something's got to go. My friends, if we want to be healed of self, then self must die. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. And this is the death. And this is the victory that we, that we must have, that we seek. As we behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This morning, my friends, God wants us to make us new creatures. This morning, God wants you to serve one master. Choose you this day. Who will you serve? This morning, God wants to make us fit for heaven. And Jesus demonstrates how we die to self and how we can have a living relationship. And this morning, I want to I give us some practical, some practical ideas which the Lord has, has given me. And Lord, what does it mean to die to self and to live for you, and to choose you? And the first thing the Lord said to me, Quinton, when I said, Lord, I want to live for you. The in introduction that Shane gave was that I'm the, I'm the president of CBH, but let me assure you that is a humbling position. For this year, I will be going and being a student. And I don't know any, any place, any organization where the president is a student. But in God's kingdom, you are not judged by your position. Your value is that your sons and daughters of God. Amen? Nothing can separate us. Romans 12 and verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good 
and acceptable, perfect will of God. Oh, I love that text. Oh, that stirs me. Uh, first time I heard that text, I heard it from the preacher, Martin Luther King. And he preached in the 70s, and his, his speech was, I have a dream. Remember that? I have a dream that men will be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. I have a dream. And this morning, my friends, I've come to tell you that Jesus has a dream this morning. And his dream is that men will be moved by the will of my Father in their lives and not by selfish ambition and pride. Someone say amen. amen. Men will be moved by the will of the Father. Do not conform to the will of this world. For this world is passing away and everything you look at is temporary. Hebrews tells us. Everything in this world is temporary. But the gift of God is life eternal and there is peace like a river for those who love the Lord my friends there are still trials in this life but the difference is that when you surrender to the Lord that you are dead to self and alive in Jesus you are working for a new government and self is not it you are allowing him to finish the work that he has begun in you to grow you into a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He, and not self, may be glorified. Turn with me to Romans 5, verses 1 to 5. This is a beautiful text. This text gives me and gives, will give us great encouragement. Romans 5, verses 1 to 5. Romans 5, verses 1 to 5. And it reads, Therefore, having been being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into His grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Mark that, mark that, uh, that text. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. My friends, this morning, Having surrendered to God, we have peace with God. Having chosen our master, having not been of two opinions, we can have peace with God. We are no longer this morning at war with God. Having seen his goodness and love and mercy and cross through the face of Jesus Christ. And we are sanctified through our continued obedience to our Father's will. For sanctification is not an event, but it is a process. The glory of God, my friends, is His character. And we stand and rejoice in the hope that the character of God may be reproduced in us. Let me read verse 2 again. Through whom also we have access by faith into His grace, in which we stand and rejoice. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God that it may be reproduced in us, His character. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into all of our hearts and His love is given and reflected in us. My friends, why is tribulation so important? To the Christian in God's eyes. Why is tribulation? Couldn't, couldn't life just be a bed of roses? Couldn't life just be easy once we accepted the, accepted the Lord? Whoop. Couldn't we just, um, we'll put that over there. Because I know I'm going to hit it again. 
Couldn't the glass just stay there and not have fallen and made this slippery? Couldn't, couldn't life be easy without trials? Couldn't it? But my friends, let me suggest to you that trials like this here, trials like this exposes who we really are. Trials like this, trials in your life exposes self, exposes our true nature, exposes our true character, and it exposes our desire for self-preservation, for self-control, self-defense, our selfishness, for self-clutches at control. Why did this have to happen, Lord? Why did this have to happen to me? For self is desperately wicked. Through tribulation, my friends, can I suggest, our true nature is exposed, our evil nature, and is this nature which must die and we surrender to God, as we surrender to God, to will and to do of His good pleasure. While everything is fine, while there's plenty of money in the bank, while things are going fine for you, we have the mask that everything's fine. But let tribulation come, and straight away self rises up. Right, I've got to do this, I've got to fix this. Or oh, anger rises up. Why did this have to happen to me? Oh, it's during tribulation that our true condition is exposed. And the Lord wants us to see our true condition. For we are naked and we're, and we're poor and we're blind and we're wretched, yet we think we're increased with goods. Trials and tribulations expose self. Thanks, deacons. So that self can be given to the Lord because we can see the ugliness of self. For there is none righteous, none good amongst us. And oh, that is so freeing. Because that does not, in my heart, that does not fill me with con condemnation. That fills me with, with, with rejoicing and with glory and with, with hope. That I can surrender to the Lord. That he, wants to, that he wants to put his character, his glory in me. For hope does not disappoint. And this is God's hope that we will want to see him, my friends. That we will want to see his love. That we will want to be with him as much as he loves us. For hope does not disappoint. For God is love and he's poured out into our hearts through the gift of Jesus Christ. God longs to restore us. Last year, I um, last year I went away Christmas time, and I went to um, uh, I went to Victoria without the family, without my family, and uh, we went four wheel driving with some of the some of the the guys, and I thought this would be a great opportunity to to get away from the family and and have a nice time and have a bit of a break from the from the children. You know how that is, parents, sometimes you think, oh, if only I could have a break. And uh, after two days, I started missing my family. I started missing seeing them. Started missing my wife and my children. And I thought to myself, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? And I longed to be back with them only after two days. Life was not the same during that separation. How I was wishing that they were missing me as much as I was missing them. And when I came back, I, call, I called up my wife and we were on the way back and I, and I said, look, we, we're on our way back and I was so excited. I thought, oh, I'm missing them and we, we were away for, I think, a week and a half or so. And I was so looking forward to the trip back home, even more so than the trip away. It's, there's something nice about going away, but there's something even better about coming home and being reunited with your children and your fathers and your family. And oh, I was hoping that they were missing me as much as I was missing them. And to my great delight, as we pulled around the corner, there is my family missing me. And here's my three children on the front lawn, sitting on their chairs and waiting for dad to drive along the road. 
and they stood up, and as the car stopped, they ran out, and they embraced, embraced me, and oh, it was a wonderful time that I could see their faces, and not just hear them over the telephone. No, my friends, look at the picture. God is missing us. He wants us to see His face. God longs for you, for eternity will not be the same without God, if you are not there. I love the, I love the, the opening passage in Steps to Christ, page 1. God is the source of life, of wisdom, and of joy. And I long to see the face of God when we get to heaven. I think of Moses. Moses longed to see the face of God. Don't you long to see the face of God? Moses longed to see the face. And he said to, in Exodus 33, verse 18 to 23, Show me your glory, Lord. Show me your glory. And Exodus 33, verse 18 to 23 says, and he, and he said, Please show me your glory. That's Moses. Then he said, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall, shall, shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock, and so it shall be, while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by and I will take away my hand and you shall see my back but my face you shall not see. For in our sinful state, in the selfish state, no man can see God and live. No man can see God and live. But Jesus, but, but God says, that I will hide you in the cleft of the rock. I will hide you in the righteousness of Jesus. And the rock, my friend, as well. We stand on the rock, and through Jesus, we can see the Father. Show us the Father. Haven't I been with you so long? And you, and you ask me, show us the Father. For I and the, I and the Father are one, Jesus said. If you want to see the Father... You stand upon Jesus and you look into his face. For the Lord says in Hebrew 10 and verse 16, For this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. I will put my law, I will put my glory back in them. For the Lord wants to have fellowship with us intimate fellowship. He wants us to be in heaven. He wants us to see him face to face and have communion like our first parents had. We that walk in the cool of the day and the cool of the evening and commune. Oh, how God longs for that. Don't you long for that? God wants to restore his character in us. And by choosing the will of God and not my own will, we reveal his wonder work, his wonderful working character in our lives through sanctification. By, and by revealing God's character, then we are truly the light of the world. God's law, my friends, is his character, the Ten Commandments, and he wants to put his character in us that we may reflect his glory. God wants to restore us by willing surrender to the Father's will. For God is shaping us up for heaven. God is shaping us up for heaven. And so I said, Lord, I want to be in heaven. I want to surrender my will. I want to, I want to will and to do of your good pleasure, Lord. Show me how it's done. What does it mean? Break it down for me in simple language, Lord. What does it mean? And the Lord says, I'm going to show you, Quentin. I'm going to show you. 
as you. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world on the cross. The Lord says, look to Calvary, and I will show you what your life may be like when you are surrendered to me and dead to sin. Mount of Blessings, page 71. This is a wonderful quote. And this quote, this quote is something to be cherished. This quote is something that we can hinge our faith on. This is something that we can stand upon. And I'd like to read to you. Because I believe that Jesus, he hung his faith, his faith hinged on this passage which uh, is from the Mount of Blessing, which allowed him to gain the victory. And it says, Our Father's presence encircled Christ, and nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. Don't miss that. Here was his source of comfort, and it is for us today. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. And catch this. Whatever comes to him comes from Christ. He has no need to resist evil for Christ is his defense. And nothing, but nothing, can touch him except by the Lord's permission. And all things that are permitted work together for the good to them that love the Lord. Did Christ have trials? Oh, you bet he had trials. Was he beaten? Oh, yes, he was. Did he have pain? Oh, yes, he was. But despite that, he surrendered to his Father's will, for he knew that nothing could come to him except it come through his Father first for the blessing of himself and for the blessing of others. And Jesus knew his Father and knew that he was loved and that nothing could touch him. And so here we find Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane and he's, he, he's about to face one of the greatest struggles of his life. And it's, the story is found in Matthew 26 and verse 39. And we read, And he went with the Father and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And again, Matthew 26, verse 42, it's recorded that he went again and he prayed. And he says, he went away a second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done and not my will be done. My friends, Jesus cried out three times. He goes away again. Not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus established a principle of humble obedience and self-surrender to the will of the Father, giving his Father total control over his life. And Jesus knew that the scriptures must be fulfilled. And he was humbled, for he knew that he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he knew that only through obedience to his Father's will could this be achieved. But Lord, show me. Show me for me. How can I do this? Show me. Lord, how can I die to self? How can I have the victory? How can I lay it at your feet? Show me more, Lord. Show me more. It's obedience. But show me more. And the Lord said, I'll show you, Quentin. And so not long after that, the soldiers came for him. And he was taken to Pilate. And when he was led away, he was falsely, uh, uh, to Caiaphas, sorry, he was led away and falsely uh, accused before Caiaphas, the high priest. 
But he did not argue, but kept silent. Verse 63 says, For in this world, the Lord says, you are judged by your works, but in God's kingdom, you are judged by your fruits. And you can argue all you'd like, but once you start arguing with people and trying to convict them, self is rising up, my friends, let people see your works and let God do the convicting. And when Jesus stood before uh, the governor Pilate, he showed mercy on him by answering him, trying to plant a seed of truth. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? So Jesus said to him, it is as you said. My friends, Jesus kept silent. He did not argue. And Pilate could see by his fruits. Pilate could see in the face of Jesus that there was no anger. That there was no self. There was no animosity. There was no hatred to the men that had falsely accused him. And he marveled. Pilate could see the innocent, yet the eyes of the saving grace of the Savior. And Pilate was almost persuaded, almost persuaded, not through argument, but because he saw the fruit. He saw the face of Jesus. He saw God's love, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, God's long-suffering. He saw the glory of God in the faith of Jesus. And he was almost persuaded, but like so many people who are almost persuaded, he took his eyes off the Lord and he looked behind and he saw the things of this world and he saw power, he saw position, and he saw performance. And he loved them more than what he loved the Lord. And, the, and power, position, and performance held him captive, and he chose the world, and he lost his life. Jesus was trying to save his enemies, his enemies' lives, in the face of ridicule and torment. Oh, my friends, when people ridicule you and torment you, how easy it is for self to rise and want to defend. Oh, my friends, but the lesson here, Jesus spoke the truth, did not argue. Let people see your fruits and let the Holy Spirit convict people. For nobody is ever saved through argument. Nobody's ever saved through argument. People are saved through seeing the love of Jesus. It is the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And so after Pilate, Jesus was then taken to the soldiers where he was beaten. And I'd like for us to read this account, this graphic account of what our Savior went through and how self had died in him and how he chose willingly to do his Father's will. And ultimately, he had the greatest victory. Matthew 27 And verse 27, Jesus taken to the soldiers' list. And the Bible records, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus in the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed on his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on his head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Oh, my friends, that is graphic. But Jesus did not complain. He did not curse. He did not resist. He simply turned his cheek to his enemy. Was this the will of God that he should suffer like this? Was this the will of God? 
Is it the will of God that we suffer sometimes? Jesus knew, oh, Jesus knew that nothing could touch him except by God's permission and that all things that are permitted work together for the good to them that love the Lord. Jesus was totally dead to self and Satan could destroy the body but he could not destroy the soul of Jesus Christ. And so he was taken to the cross. He was marched up that hill called Golgotha, bearing his cross, and he was crucified between two robbers. Then Satan said to him, Save yourself. If you are the Son of God, Come down from the cross. Oh, my friends, this morning, we say to Jesus, Lord, I want to be crucified with you. I want to be crucified on the cross that self may not live. And the devil says, uh-huh, you want to be crucified with the Lord. Well, I'm going to test you. I'm going to test you. But nothing comes through us except it comes through the Father. So here we are, Lord, I am crucified with you on the cross. I surrender to self. I want to die with you. I want to live with you. But the, the devil says, okay, I'm going to test you out. So what the devil says is, right, I'm going to grab some trials. I'm going to grab some problems. I'm going to grab the football. Out here on the cross, arms unstretched. And the devil grabs the problem and he throws it to you. Oh, and too often we go, oh, it's so heavy. It's so heavy, Lord. Well, hang on. I thought burdens were lifted at Calvary. Why is it so heavy? And the Lord said to me, when the devil throws a problem to you, don't catch them. Surrender them to me, for they, the problems don't go to the ground. They go up. The problems come and go up through prayer and supplication. You stay hanging on that cross. Don't touch those problems, my friend, because the problems come from the world. And so we catch the problem and we think, it's so heavy, Lord. Now I have to hop down and I have to go and solve these problems. Oh, where are you going to go? Once you hop down to the cross, my friends, you've got to go back into the world to solve those problems. Oh, and the devil loves that death. He says, mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I can see that uh, they love these problems. They're not fully surrendered. And they don't know the secret. The secret of success is not my will. Your will be done, Lord. Give the problem straight to the Father. Stay out straight. And too many of us, we say we want to die to the Lord and die to self. But we go out and the rent comes. The house bills come. The car bills come. Daily life, the cares of this world come, the faults of others come. And instead of giving to the Lord, we catch them. We say, Oh Lord, why is this burden so heavy? And he says, Burdens are lifted at Calvary, my friend. Oh, and the devil knows once you hop down off the cross, the cross is anchored in the rock. Jesus Christ, while you are anchored in the rock, you are safe and secure. But once you hop down off that cross onto your own two feet, you are any man's, you are the devil's playground because he will just sweep you away. And for so many of us, the Lord showed me we all have a cross to bear. And there are a lot of empty crosses out there because far too often we start the journey. Climb onto the cross, but we catch those burdens. And we go into the world to solve the cares of this life for ourselves. And we get snared by the devil. And so, and so too often, many of us never come back to the cross. My friends, this morning, where are you? Are you out there trying to solve problems by yourself? And come back to the cross back to the cross of Jesus. For in it, there is safety, there is security, there is salvation. 
And oh, the cross. The world looks as, looks at the cross as defeat. But my friends, I'm here to tell you, at the cross, there is victory at the cross. You stand at the cross for Jesus, and you will have victory over self. You will have victory forevermore. Burdens this morning are lifted at Calvary. And even the robbers, even the robbers next to, next to the Lord, they reviled him. And sometimes Satan uses those most close to us. Your family, your friends, family always hurts. You stay on that cross. But when your father and your mother forsake you, when your family forsake you, the Lord will pick you up. The Lord will carry you. Stay on that cross. Oh, my friends, the nails that held Jesus. The nails that were on the, that was, was sent through Jesus' feet and through his hands. Make no mistake that those nails were not there to hold him on the cross. He stayed on the cross for you and for me as an example. And throughout eternity, when we get to heaven and we see the nail print hands, we will see what I have done to my Savior, what I have done, what self has done to the Lord, that sin may never rise again. So this morning, Jesus is on the cross. Jesus is on the cross, silent, not arguing. Jesus is on the cross. And one of the men looks into Jesus' face and sees the glory of the Father, sees the love, sees that there's no hatred, no animosity, sees the Savior, the saving grace, and is convicted and says, Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord says, today I tell you, I make this promise, you will be with me in paradise. My friends, Jesus was saving people, was saving you and I, still on the cross. And the Lord said to me, Quentin, you work from the cross. You stay on the cross. You love from the cross, you save from the cross. You forgive people from the cross, for the cross is a symbol of victory. For when we surrender self to the cross, it is a victory. For Babylon truly is fallen. Babylon truly is fallen. And Satan's stronghold is broken at the cross. You remain at the cross. When problems come to you, you give them straight to the Lord, and He will sustain you. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, for they shall rise up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not grow weary, and they shall walk and not faint. For it's not in their power, it's not in their strength, but it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Lord, after He finished His work, the Bible says he bowed his head and he said, it is finished and he died. And my friends, that sent shockwaves through Satan. That sent shockwaves through Satan's kingdom. For what was finished? Satan was finished. Self was finished. The power of Satan's kingdom was finished. The philosophy that righteousness comes through self-effort and will was finished. The philosophy that I can do all things apart from God was finished. The philosophy that if you look good on the outside, then you must be clean on the inside. You whitewashed tombs, the Lord said to the Pharisees, for on the outside you think you are clean, but on the inside, self. Is very much alive. But victory comes by lifting Jesus higher. My friends, today, where are you? 
You can have a new life today, but you need to die first to self. For today you cannot serve two masters. Wake out of slumber and choose you this day who will you serve. For Jesus has conquered self. That is why he can say that you can be more than conquerors. Why not let God into your heart this morning and let him operate on your heart. Let him operate on your heart, on your legs, on your arms, on your body. Let him heal the brokenness. Let him give you a new heart. Let him have his way in you. My friends, this morning, the invitation is still there, the Lord says. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you, including righteousness by faith. Because it's his righteousness, it's his faith that he gives you. Seek ye first, and he'll give it to you. This morning, the Lord says to us, faith is the victory. Faith in Jesus Christ, that he may will and to do of his good pleasure. This morning, do you want that victory? And it is yours by faith. And it's a free gift that was purchased at Calvary. This morning, my friends, Jesus is outstretched. And he says, look to the cross of Calvary. Work from the cross. Stay on the cross. For it is finished. My friends, this morning Jesus says to us that truly burdens are lifted at Calvary. Amen.